Hey, hello, I'm Captain Iceblock. I represent Storm Spirit players around the world, and inside the channel, you'll find guides on Storm, other heroes, middle lane mechanics, streams, and coaching sessions. Your support keeps the content flowing, and if you'd like to contribute, find out how down below. With all that said, let's go. Welcome to the mid lane training week. These sessions should help you either learn, familiarize, or refine the skills necessary to succeed in the middle lane. We will start with the basic stuff and end with complex movements and mechanics. Each of these training sessions can be done in the demo lobby, a bot game, or applied practically in live matches. How much time you are willing to devote to each session is entirely up to you. Let's begin. The idea behind blocking the creeps is that they end up in a favorable position for you and disadvantages for the enemy. For mid heroes who have higher base damage than the opponent, ideal meeting location for the creeps is on their own high ground. This makes it easier to maintain the lane equilibrium, trade harassment by utilizing the uphill miss chance and or vision, and puts the enemy into easier to gank situation. Open your veins. Other uses while blocking include letting the ranged creep walk first. This ensures that once that creep dies, the wave will be pushed under the blocker's tower, allowing for a somewhat safer last hit environment rather than in an open area. Well said. Lastly, some players may choose not to block at all. If an enemy sports slow base damage and would have trouble last hitting under the tower, a pushed onto him wave would allow to get in extra harassment and mess with his last hits. Leap forward. Good idea. The technique itself is simple. Position yourself right on top of your walking wave, moving the smallest steps, stopping for only long enough to pause the creeps, but not long enough to force them to walk around you. I myself would double click my control key of my hero, hold it, this makes the camera follow the hero, letting me focus entirely on the movements. This was day one of mid lane training, good luck. Prepare for battle. <laughs> Pulling is an act of manipulating the creep aggro to favor the player. The technique itself is fairly simple to learn and the outcome of it has many uses for the player to master. The aggro draw occurs whenever the player right clicks or attack clicks an opposing hero anywhere on the map. A range check happens within the 500 radius originating from the attacking hero. Any enemy creeps within this range will begin focusing the aggressor for 2 seconds. If the player is continuously out of range for the melee creeps, they will select a new closest unit. Storms are coming. The enemy creeps will only react to the pull if they can see the aggressor. This means that if the player right clicks from the fog, no enemy creeps will be pulled until the next aggro check occurs in 2 seconds. Keep in mind that any unit, here included, attacking from the fog will have a small radius of revealed vision, so continuous attacks from the fog will eventually draw the aggro. This also means that the player who wants to pull the creeps, but is in the shadow of the high ground, can do so by walking into vision of his own ranged creep. Also keep in mind that while only the creeps within 500 radius with vision on the hero will get pulled, the aggro check is performed globally. This means that the player can set up camera hotspots in the options, and whenever the pull is needed, but there is no enemy hero or vision of him, the player can right click enemy heroes from other lanes. Whenever successful pull is performed, enemy creeps get closer to the pulling hero. By reducing the distance needed to travel to last hit, the player risks less harassment, and by constantly blocking the incoming wave and drawing the enemy creeps to own high ground, the player maintains positional advantage. There are more practical uses for pulling the creeps and will be explored in another session. That is all for today, good luck! Harassment is an act of inflicting minor continuous damage at every convenient moment. It can be done with spells as a direct or indirect hit, but most of the time it'll simply be throwing right clicks whenever possible. 
To be most efficient, the laning priority goes like this, taking the last hit or the deny, adjusting creep equilibrium via pulling or nuking the wave in order to push out. And when not doing any of the above tasks, players should fill in these moments with attacks to the enemy hero. The best place to be training hits with the enemy is on high ground. The added tower armor, coupled with enemy's low ground disadvantage and possible vision loss, makes trading very efficient for the hero holding the high ground. However, as discussed in previous day, right clicks are less using an orb attack to attract enemy creeps. In order to minimize damage taken, attacking player must always be aware of his position in regards to the enemy creeps. Beginning the attack from behind on creeps will make the enemy once waste a few moments traveling to the hero and, depending on distance traveled, deal less or none of the damage. Other thing to keep in mind is the number of the creeps in the given area. Generally, the player with more creeps to work with should be trading more aggressive than the player with fewer. For example, if the enemy ranged creep has been dispatched first, the attacking player now has the numbers advantage and can trade hits more efficiently than the enemy. And if the enemy wave is about to be cleared, attacking player can opt to move in closer between attacks. This will allow the hero to launch a few more hits while the enemy hero is forced to retreat behind his next wave. Depending on how well were the first trades executed, the better player can completely take over the lane and snowball from there, especially if the opponent did not bring enough regen and has to play passively in fear of dying. Also, keep in mind that this is a very general rundown of trading harassment. How much pressure, if any, a player would want to dish out differs greatly depending on the lane goals, hero differences, health differences and many other factors. Each match will be different. And this concludes day 3, good luck! In order to maximize the available resources on the map, a player should look for ways to leave the lane without losing too much farm. The most common method is by pushing the creep meeting point forward, either through spells or killing the enemy ranged creep first. As a result, friendly creeps will end up on the enemy high ground, opening the river for safe travels and pinning the enemy hero under his own tower. In an ideal scenario, by the time you return from your side quest, your old wave should be dead and a new wave should meet again somewhere near, repeating the process. But the most important factor is actually watching the game timer. If you begin the wave clear at the wrong time, it is possible that the enemy already left to collect the newly spawned rune, or by the time you arrive at the camp you wanted to stack, it is already too late. So during each match, we will want to practice placing our wave at the enemy tower by the time the rune spawns, and a bit earlier for the jungle stacking. How early to begin clearing the wave will depend on each individual hero's wave clear capabilities, risk factor by being in the lane and levels. For example, with Storm Spirit, if it is lethal to approach the lane at level 5, at level 6 it completely turns around, as by then Storm can either zip in, clear the wave zip out, or just go for a kill. I must mention here that depending on the matchup, a player might choose to simply stay in the lane for the entire time if he is able to completely deny resources to the enemy. By sacrificing extra farm on his own end, the player is preventing enemy hero from snowballing, which ends up being a positive trade for the entire team. This is a very simplified example, and if you'd like more information, I've discussed this topic in the first 15 minutes video. Bottom tower is under attack. And my rage will bring me back. And this concludes day four. Good luck. Last time we learned about pushing out lanes, which allows the player to take on side quests. And since there isn't much to learn about hitting the jungle camps repeatedly, we'll talk about runes. There are 6 total, and each offer unique ways to utilize them in the lane. Starting with haste, while it does not offer any significant offensive advantage, it is essentially a get out of the jail free card, if you're playing a hero that is susceptible to ganks. Dash around dangerous situations with unhindered positioning for taking those sweet last hits. 
And if you're a battle user, remember to only activate haste when a clear objective shows up, such as dodging something, preparing to take another rune, stack a camp, gank a lane, or any of the above if there's enough time left on haste to run back to base and teleport back fully refreshed. Invisibility rune is probably most an inventive of the band. Optimal use is basically pre-positioning the hero for some free last hits or harassment, which would cost some health normally. The rune, however, comes in handy later in the game, when an invisible hero can utilize it sneakily traveling around the map to scout out ganks. Moving on, we've got double damage. As invisibility, this one is pretty straightforward and operates on the same concept. Enabling it allows you to outlast hit your opponent more easily, making tactical swings and retreats, which would otherwise cast some harassment back. Aim to deal as much right clicks as reasonably possible, less hit critical creeps, and at later levels it often secures kills. Now, Arcane Rune is a bit of a mix between regeneration and double damage. What it does is by lowering spell cooldowns and cost, enables the user to dish out damage cheaper and faster. So as long as you have it up, aim to deal as much damage to the opposing hero while it lasts. This is of course only applicable to heroes with proper spammable spells and not very useful on something like Sniper. Storm on the other hand loves the rune and in the late game can make some otherwise impossible pickoffs with it. Speaking of regeneration, it is also the same principle. The fact that a hero can regenerate to full enables us to just begin harassing the enemy relentlessly. If the enemy does not have enough regen through items himself, this can often win the lane for the aggressor hero, since the defender now has to play from behind the tower while waiting for courier to send out selves. Just make sure to be aware of any long range spells that can disable the regenerating hero, such as invokers called snap. And lastly, Illusion Rune. It is by far the weakest in the early game, but the one which has the most uses, both in early and late. Most common practice is just to use the illusions as extra harassment or last hit potential. And that is fine if it's something that gives you an advantage over the opposing mid player. However, for heroes that have flash farming capabilities, such as Storm, the illusions are best sent out to the jungle camps and used to stack it. Other uses include tanking tower dives, sending illusions to deny runes, use them as walking wards, and some heroes can use them on cliffs as stationary wards. Whichever rune you plan to use, remember to use it at the peak of opportunity. Using a powerful rune to harass and push out only helps the mid laner to secure the next rune. Holding out a defensive rune can prevent or turn a gank. And remember that other heroes can utilize some runes better so consider leaving double damage for PA and illusions for terror blade. And this concludes day 5, good luck! Today, we'll learn everything there is to know about tower, its priorities and how to abuse it. First, we need to differentiate between tower's attack range and tower's aggro acquisition range. Attack range is displayed when the player presses Alt and is set at 700. This is where the tower will simply attack whoever is in that range. At 500 radius, however, the tower will select a target from its list of priorities. The topmost priority is always the enemy hero attacking the friendly hero. After that, it's the closest creep attacking the friendly hero. And lastly, it's either creep or the hero attacking the tower. Now, the tower will continually attack its current target until it dies, becomes invulnerable, goes out of range, or, if the target is a hero, until the hero switches targets. As soon as the tower acquires a new target, a 2 second cooldown on the aggro surge is issued, and that's what harassing under tower is all about. So, let's talk technique. Once you know approximately where the tower's 500 aggro acquisition range starts, you can issue attack order on the opposing hero. What this does is put 2 seconds cooldown on the tower's aggro surge. And what this means is that during these 2 seconds you are free to attack whoever you want. You 
If you misjudge the range or the timer, you can always reset the tower's aggro by issuing an attack order on a nearby friendly creep. Indeed. Practice this technique in the demo lobby, then perfect it during live games. And this concludes day 6, good luck. For the past 6 days, we've been learning practical movements, and today, for graduation, we'll discuss specific scenarios where a player can apply those movements to help win the lane. As always, while the clips will be mostly told from Storm's perspective, the topic applies to all the heroes, and I'll try to provide various practical examples. First strategy we can apply in our lane is double waving. Achieved by quickly removing enemy's ranged creep, then dragging the rest of the creeps around the area by aggro control, it'll force two waves of creeps under the enemy tower while he is still level 1 and the aggressor is level 2. Imagine Lina double waving Shadow Friend. Massive creep advantage, two spells, great range, all the while Shadow Friend struggles to last hit under the tower. This can often win the lane from the first minute. To me. Of course, double waving isn't always required to deliver sufficient harassment damage to the opponent under his tower. As long as the aggressor can dance around the tower's aggro range, he is free to right click the opponent without consequences. And sometimes, against heroes that don't have spells to secure last hits, maintaining the wave meeting point near the middle will allow the better player to just abuse creep aggro to easily score last hits and denies. This strategy is ideally used by high right click damage heroes to secure every last hit against opposing player. A good example would be Bloodseeker vs Alchemist. But in most occasions, if you can, you should make sure that every wave ends up walking towards the enemy tower. This achieves several things. Pushed out lane means creep advantage, allowing the aggressor to trade hits better. And the opponent that is competing with a tower for last hits will have trouble harassing you back. Less harassment means less gold spent on regeneration, faster battle or other items. A wounded opponent is also less confident about walking out less hit in fear of more damage taken. And if harassing doesn't benefit you that much, after pushing out a wave, you are also free to take the rune or stack jungle for yourself. Lastly, if your opponent isn't in the lane for any reason, pushing out makes sure tower will take damage while the enemy is away. This is especially true for the waves which include catapult every 5 minutes. And this transitions into another strategy, maintaining lane advantage. Doesn't matter if you keep the lane static or push out every wave, as long as the opponent is crippled for one reason or another, you are doing your job right. Against heroes that require farm to snowball, keeping their laning at a disadvantage is the best approach. A Monkey King who cannot jungle well and is at risk of dying every time he approaches the lane is probably going to be behind for the entire game. Storm Force Double Damage! Radiant mid This battle isn't over yet. Some people, some manners. And heroes like Drow and TA, who like to farm both lane and ancients, are also going to be useless if you post skill potential wherever you go. Over here now! I'm over here! Weep not for me. Blown away! Not to mention, someone like Sky or Lion, if denied snowballing, are nothing more than a glorified mid support. The killing spree! 
Here I am. Stop looking for me. So as long as you being in the lane presents skill threat and will prevent the enemy from snowballing, you should do so. Of course, some games you'll face heroes that are either hard to shut down or shutting them down doesn't accomplish much because they can simply recover extremely easy. When facing a Viper, Alchemist, Medusa, Meepo, most of the time they won't fall behind because of how fast they can operate in the jungle. In these cases, it's best to have heroes that can either farm fast on their own or create space by securing the side lanes. An alchemist that enters mid game almost 6 slotted will have trouble ending the match because in his absence Storm has managed to become unstoppable. And some games you'll just have to lose mid either through mistakes, ganks or just an unfavorable matchup. In these games, it is important to notice when the lane becomes a dead lane and it's best to focus efforts somewhere else. A flash farming hero like Storm can recover just fine in the jungle. Other heroes such as Kanka will want to seek pickoffs in the side lanes. As long as you don't fall too far behind, usually one gank on the snowballing opponent is enough to recover. but even an unfavorable matchup can be leveraged by simply outlasting through opponent's initial harassment. Bringing enough regen against heroes that just dump their spells on you can often help you enough not to be underfarmed or underleveled and by playing the lane right can often turn the unfavorable matchup around to a victory. If you both trade harassment but the enemy runs out of regeneration, congratulations, you heal up and he is no longer a threat. In the same manner, if you kill your opponent and he just respawns with full mana health and you just sit there unable to recover, then you help yourself lose the lane. Sometimes winning the lane can result in enemy heroes focusing all the efforts to shut you down. In that case, simply keeping an eye on hero rotations can result in three of them attempting to gank non-existent lane while you just created space by farming the jungle. And sometimes it doesn't matter who is winning the lane, jungle is simply faster. Heroes like Viper, Drow benefit the most from living in the jungle as soon as it is sustainable for them to do so. This also frees up the lane for an underleveled support or a carry that cannot farm in his own lane. Technical difficulties. So far, we've covered all the major strategies to use in the mid lane. As a bonus, let's throw in some smaller tips that can also help win the lane. Buying and placing your own mid wards is better than relying on supports to do so. Killing spree! <laughs> Recognize your power spikes. For some heroes, it is there as soon as level 6. Double kill! Zip zap! Zip! Ah! Also, recognize the reverse power spikes. Enemy just used his offensive spells. Whoa, what I miss! Killing spree! He'll be weak for the next few seconds, and that's the best time to move in for the kill. 
Sometimes you can secure the ranged creep last hit by simply moving your own hitbox over the creep, then using auto attack to target the closest enemy, or in this case, letting the spells do the job. Speaking of last hitting the ranged creep, you can also simply position yourself in the path to your own. This tells the enemy that if he attempts to go for the last hit, he will suffer heavy damage in return. This results in an easy deny. In another example, by positioning yourself closer to enemy's possible escape route, you can bait him into uncomfortable lane movements, sometimes forcing him out entirely. And this concludes day 7 and graduates you from the mid lane training week. I hope the information was useful, and for your future mid matchups, good luck!